All right, well, uh, thank you very much for the very nice invitation for the interest in this problem, like um, I'm going to uh, talk about in the next few slides. This is a the particular application of numerical relativity, which means the numerical integration of Einstein's equation to the large scale structure. But this is a problem that, as a matter of fact, could carry over to many different areas. So the scale, per se, is not an, an, an ingredient. And in addition to this, which is perhaps a take home lesson that you could take from the seminar, there's a number of open questions that even people that don't necessarily work in this field could be interested in, because I think that these are open questions that many people tend to ask themselves, even when they take their first course in general relativity. And so in, uh, there, I think there is a general message. It's not necessarily a message that contains a whole lot of information yet, but at least the fact that there's a question out there then it's to be sorted out in general relativity, I think is, is quite interesting. So the main question obviously is, are there relativistic effects that are not taken into account by the current models that we use in cosmology? And again, I kind of more interested in the large scale structure and the sort of the large scale universe. So in particular, I mean the concordance model here, but you could take this question and reformulate it it, in terms of any other model that you, that you can um, imagine that may entail gravity and relativistic gravity, general relativity, and uh, ask yourself that question in that context. And the first thing is that, um, as we were discussing with Maria Teresa, when cosmological models are constructed typically on very different scales, uh, some conceptual issues, some, some issues of consistency between different approximation and how they're blended together in order to make a single model uh, come up. So even before you, you look at the data or wonder about how these models fare when they're compared to data, there's already in there a conceptual issue you need to sort that out. And this has been done to several degrees um, in the past. But as data becomes more important, then you kind of have to keep asking that question and finding new answers for it. And then, re 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 relatively to the fact that we have now missions that are uh, bound to explore the universe to unprecedented accuracy, of course, um, observational tensions will and have already started to emerge within those data sets. And we, in some cases, we don't really know how these uh, uh, can be resolved. Perhaps better modeling could help in that sense. A uh, quick question. Are you going to tell me when I have five minutes left or so? Okay, prefer. Oh, great. So the main question then from this is how exactly, once you have structures in general relativity, so you typically know that some fundamental solutions to the equation, say the solution for an isolated object with, without angular momentum, and the main question, and this is something that I think many people, even at the unconscious level, ask themselves when f they first meet the fundamental solutions to general relativity. We have a way to describe isolated objects. We have a way to describe um, larger systems where mass is not isolated, is uh, in a sense distributed homogeneously. Um, how do you construct models that take both of these into account? How do you construct Thing because, as you imagine, the large scale universe is in fact going to be something more along those lines. So, you will have the isolated objects, but these isolated objects will be immersed in something that on larger scales is overall uh, uh, homogeneous and isotropic. And so, to, to make it even more precise, the what is the relationship between isolated object solutions and FLRW, Friedman Lemaitre Robertson Walker models, in general relativity? So does FLRW emerge when you connect many different isolated objects in general relativity? And what, does, what do these isolated object solutions look like when you try uh, to put them together? And this is really the main question at the core of general relativity, because being a nonlinear theory, obviously, you cannot use the superposition principle. You know, superposition principle will give you something that is not a solution of the equation. So the question is, what do you have to add? What, what is there um, that is necessary in order to make this a solution? These are exactly the, in, the important effects that fields like numerical relativity, but also 
perturbation theory or the post-Newtonian expansions try to quantify. Now, since uh, you know, from from n n here um, uh, here and then, they there will be places in uh, this talk where I would actually focus the problem to the large scale universe. But we don't necessarily. I mean, if there's questions or um, uh, sort of uh, ideas about how these methods can uh, apply to other areas, we could certainly discuss this. And this is one of these places because, given that. Uh, my main interest is in this field. Of course, the main question is how w the main model that is out there is the concordance model, which means um, that this is the starting point of uh, this analysis, where um, we sort of figure out what the um, sort of description of the universe is with the current models before we try to figure out how to, to sort of improve them. And the concordance model, probably many of you know, is based on this predication that you have a cosmological principle which states that any credible realistic model of the universe must be such that on large enough scales, and this is left in some sense unspecified, you need to have a homogeneous and isotropic space, which means homogeneous isotropic matter distribution on average, curvature, and so on. And based on this, then the, the um, idea is that you can s construct one such model by taking an FLRW background, perturbing it in some ways, so with typically linear per perturbations. And then when you're interested in the more nonlinear parts of the gravitational fields, which is when matter starts to collapse and form structures, you use Newtonian physics and typically combine with a numerical approach where uh, sort of the, the um, uh, gravitational field is integrated numerically. And so you have this sort of two regimes. You have a regime which is around 10 kiloparsec where you have this isolated object picture. You know, the distance between these objects is much larger than the scale at which you're studying it. And so you have the sort of isolated, isolated object picture here. And at the same time, you have another regime on much larger scale, typically six order of magnitudes larger, where on the other hand, you have a, the picture of a completely or nearly homogeneous fluid. And you consider this completely relativistic. So you have a relativistic linear regime and you have a non-linear, non-relativistic regime. And what is missing for the model is exactly how to blend these things together, how to construct uh, solutions that um, are at the same time that in, in some sense incorporate the non-linear relativistic effects and therefore can give you an estimate of how important these non-linear relativistic effects are. In a, in a certain sense, such a model would then give you a, a, an estimate of the systematic errors included uh, sort of uh, n that are implied by the concordance model. Um, now, of course, this is a huge simplification. No? <coughs> it lets you, um, with a relatively simple framework, analyze a number of issues that uh, uh, you find, for instance, in observational missions. There are a lot of cosmological processes. They are uh, studied in very great depth uh, nowadays. And a model like this actually takes you a very long way into understanding these processes. The question is, is this model now good enough for what we are interested in uh, at, at the present stage? And I think one of the um, uh, indications that perhaps this is not the case is that there's a famous tension right now for the measurement of the um, H0, the Hubble constant, uh, which um, essentially is exemplified by these two data sets. So the first one comes from essentially CMB experiments, so it's plug, but also combined with other uh, experiments that um, um, also study CMB physics which gives you a value of the co constant, which is around 69 kilometers per second per megaparsec. And then last year, there was a study by Iris et al. in which uh, the same measurement based on the local universe, which means essentially standard candles on relatively low re redshift, yields a much higher value, which is around 73. And now the error bars have become such that these two um, um, values are incompatible to more than two sigma levels. And many people, I mean, if you, if you talk with people from, from different fields, they have different understanding of the problem. 
Uh, one is that, for instance, experimental systematics could play a role in this, and probably experimental systematics do play a role, because, for instance, we know that this value, if, uh, if you only consider, um, say, the result that comes from Planck, would be even lower. So even if you have different experiments that all study the sort of the same physics, uh, they already get slightly different answers, and it is possible that there is in there some uncontrolled systematics that hasn't been taken into account that will, I guess, bring this error bar to a little larger uh, value. The other thing is that, of course, working out cosmological parameters, you know, I, I said, okay, we have this model, it simply only has a small number of parameters, but as a matter of fact, there's a lot of physics that's hidden in there because typically in order to use the things like CMB or supernovae as probes of cosmological evolution, there's a lot of physics uh, that you have to either know or model or assume about these sources. And so for instance, sources, astrophysical processes, things that you don't necessarily know how to model, typically enter via a parameter that you also fit along with everything else. So perhaps this is also an, a source that could resolve this conflict. And finally, of course, there's this idea that if you are neglecting some relativistic effects, this could also uh, result in some systematics. So it is important to uh, factor them in as well. And <coughs> in addition to this, this there's, uh, let's say, a, a problem connected with the modeling. And perhaps some of you have seen this paper from last year, which, however, is uh, um, they've been in the news quite recently, so um, some of you may, might have uh, picked it up somewhere, uh, where the idea is that when you have a space where um, you sort of try to build the average cosmological field by integrating in time an initial average rather than integrating in time the full equations and then performing an average, this is actually an, um, quite complex um, um, operation of unknown systematics because we know that this the order in which we execute this operation is important these two operations do not commute and so lately they as in this this particular paper they have pointed out that uh, if they do this two operation in some way in a slightly more correct order um, then they can get uh, say for instance a Hubble diagram that matches what you get from, say, type 1a supernova uh, without the need of a cosmological constant. And as a matter of fact, as a bonus in their study, they also show that they can reconcile these two values, these two different values that are low redshift and high redshift of H0. Now, you have to take this with a bit of a caveat, and there's two papers that discuss what may be the shortcomings of this study, but I, I think it just shows the fact that there's uh, something in there that's a little more, s more subtle than what we have presently um, uh, known. And uh, of course there's also the giant field of data analysis which in, in itself contains a lot of subtle points. I think maybe some of you are also aware of this paper where again they show that uh, if you do a, if you um, control the uh, observation or experimental systematics if you wanted supernovae again you find that an, an, actual, uh, an accelerating universe is just as um, favored by the data set as one that is not so d there's a lot of things in there and again this is also something that um, um, you have to take with a grain of salt there's a lot of uh, things that are involved in these studies that have to be uh, controlled uh, in a better way but it's certainly, these are in, in, in a sense glimpses into the fact that there might be a more complex problem than we previously thought, or that the problem has become more complex because we have more precise data. And so the, the idea is essentially very well um, exemplified by this diagram. We used to have a CMB uh, data set that uh, had this, this level of accuracy that has become the, so over the past two decades, and finally this one. And so if observationalists ma make that kind of progress, obviously modeling needs to step up to the same extent if you want to draw the exact conclusion of the sort of similarly good conclusions from your data sets. If you don't have modeling that is good enough, you risk misinterpreting your data and finding things like, for instance, that tension getting to inconsistencies. And this is um, also particularly important because 
not only for cosmology itself, which is uh, already quite an unimportant endeavor, but because cosmology is typically used as a fundamental ingredient in other studies. So whatever error you make in cosmology has the danger of propagating itself into other fields. And a classical example of this is uh, the paper from last year where uh, the LIGO collaboration analyzed the astrophysical properties of the first event, now GW150914. And if you take a look at this paper at one point, it says that the luminosity distance of this source uh, can, can work out immediately from the waveform. This is actually an old result from the maker relative or from in general general relativity that was published in the 80s. Once the moment you get a waveform, you know the luminosity distance of this object. Uh, what you cannot work out is the redshift. And you need the redshift in order, for instance, to calculate things like the, the rest mass of the components of the binary in, in the rest frame, basically. Uh, because what you get from the waveform is the redshifted mass. And so in order to get a redshift from this luminosity distance, they have to assume a cosmology. And if you can see, they, they actually take H0 to be the, the very low value, so the, the Planck-only value of H0. If you were to correct this for, with, for instance, the, the higher redshift universe, you get a higher, you know, almost 10% difference with this, which would result in a similar error in the redshift and therefore in the masses. And okay, reading wrong masses of black holes, perhaps it's not so big a deal if we have a 10% 10, 10 error bar that might not actually affect our physics so much. But the moment LIGO is gonna start looking at say, Neutron star binaries, the mass of a neutron star is something that people are interested in, in all sorts of fields, in fact, are interested in knowing certainly the better extent than 10% because there's equation of state uh, uh, considerations that go into this and um, what the maximal mass uh, of a neutron star could be. So things like this are actually going to affect. So a, an error in the cosmological parameters could compromise these studies as well. And in particular, now there's a lot of talk about this multi-messenger astronomy, where you study at the same time uh, the, a, a system under its gravitational wave signature and electromagnetic signature. And if you don't combine this well enough, if the model somehow doesn't let you, then you might not be able to use this in an effective way. So this, this idea that you can see things after two different, uh, in two different uh, fields uh, may actually not uh, work out. So the question then is, how do we improve on this model? And this is what I said at the beginning. So there are these two regimes, we have to figure out how to blend them. The first way is to go from the fundamental isolated object uh, uh, solution and try to build a cosmology out of this. And typically this entails taking the Newtonian interaction and adding post-Newtonian corrections to it and see what the result is. And this has been uh, spearheaded by Daniel Thomas and Julian Adamus and then this paper that came last year. And um, it, it is quite interesting because it lets you in some sense work in your uh, in, in a concordance model setting and without changing too much of your uh, infrastructure, just add in these terms and see which, which ones are, are important. And so it's something wi which is extremely practical from the, from the practical same standpoint, but at the same time, it entails a post-Newtonian approach to the gravitational interaction. This is, this is great from those parts where general relativity is basically just a correction. Of new to Newtonian gravity, but there we know that there are some places, some regimes in which general relativity is qualitatively different. There are some effects that are ex exclusively relativistic, and so this sort of approach may hinder this this sort of um, insight. At the same time, one could could go in the reverse way. So we have relatively good control over perturbed FLRW spacetimes, we could think, for instance, of adding there the nonlinearity, solving there the full equations, uh, in order to get to this nonlinear stage, which is the one that we're interested in studying. And this is also something that has uh, gotten a bit of momentum in recent years. So there were some studies by uh, Tim Clifton over the past few years and a number of uh, numerical relativity simulations. That is great because in some sense you're then really looking for exact solution of general relativity that include all the requirements that you want. But typically most of them 
will require a high computational cost, which means also that the sort of realism that you can afford is extremely low. And the cosmologies that I will present are, as a matter of fact, very simplified and certainly not at the level of, uh, say, an end body simulation. So you, you kind of have these two approaches that try to go to the same problem on two different directions and haven't quite met in the middle yet. So numerical relativity, and then the, this idea that I present as the last, the, the second of these two possible approaches. So the fact that you integrate Einstein's equation exactly in order not to miss any of the terms, basically it requires casting Einstein's equation in uh, a form that can be integrated numerically. That is the core of this field. So somehow you have to take that GAB equal to 8, 8 pi TAB and turning into something that uh, you know how to handle. That typically means an initial boundary value problem, so something like the wave equation. And uh, this means that in particular the first step that you need to take is to get rid of the uh, nice covariance of general relativity theory and start specifying things. If you have an initial value problem, obviously that entails knowing, having a sense of what time is. And so in practice what you do is you make, you take your space time, you um, single out a uh, monotonic uh, function in there, a scalar function in there that has time-like normal and our time-like gradient, and then you call that a time direction and start projecting the, the geometrical projection of your equation along the space-time. That's the first thing. So you, you break the invariance, of course, but at the same time you get a system that you know how to treat. Um, as a consequence of this splitting, you get this. This is usually called a 3 plus 1 decomposition. So you project the metric in this fashion. You get this alpha and beta. They, in, in some sense, represent how you have chosen the scalar function. And then you have a three-dimensional metric that uh, um, represent the metric tensor, the spatial metric tensor in this three-dimensional hypersurfaces that correspond to constant time. And once you have this, you know how you can define, OK, the first derivative of the metric in order to have a first order system. And then your Einstein's equation become these four equations. Um, this is a scalar and a vector equation that are called the constraints that um, basically have to be satisfied by the field at any given uh, time. It's quite similar to what happens with the uh, Maxwell system. And then you have two evolution equations that tell you how these two quantities, which is really just the metric, evolve in time. And these are obviously much more complicated looking than Einstein's equation, but at least this is a system of PDEs and you, you know how to integrate this numerically. And so the idea is that, first of all, you decide what space you're trying to uh, simulate. So you choose a topology and a stress energy content. You do a projection of the important part of the um, T mu nu or TAB in this fashion. Once you have this, you have to figure out what the, the um, configuration of the gravitational field is initially for these two values. And th this, if you want, is the relativistic generalization of the Poisson equation. Uh, choose numerical coordinates, so decide how exactly you're going to propagate the coordinates in the spacetime, and then integrate this to time equation along with whichever equation represents the evolution of matter. So if you have a fluid or perfect fluid in there or a scalar field, you will have different evolution equation for that. And then you carry this out uh, iteratively until you've gotten the solution, um, you've gotten the, the, the time development of the space time that you require. Um, now, as a matter of fact, this sort of, so this is a completely generic uh, framework, and this has in fact been applied to cosmology uh, m many times and not just for the problem that I've, dis I've been describing. So numerical relativity as a field has developed over the past mm, perhaps 40 years, and there is essentially a burst of studies in cosmology, once cosmology is not its main application area, but there's, a, there's been a burst of study in cosmology at least every decade. Uh, Typically, the main application area of numerical relativity is, however, compact object physics. This is probably where you have first uh, seen of it. This has become kind of a, an iconic picture that gets shown in all numerical relativity talks. Uh, the idea is that there is at least another important part, another important system for which relativistic effects that cannot be modeled in any other way um, 
are play a, a major role and this is the collision of two compact objects in particular the gravitational wave emission most of the reasons why people are interested in this system is that because these guys are um, sources of gravitational uh, waves and so we're talking about black, about black hole binaries or neutron star binaries um, binaries of, of a mixed sort gravitational collapse and so on but in principle, as I described the system, you could just integrate Einstein's equation in whichever sort of scenario you want. And so, like I said, there have been, for instance, singularity studies in the very uh, early ages of numerical relativity. Uh, there have been studies of inhomogeneous inflation. That's another field that has sort of periodically interested people. If you have, can, can you simulate the um, um, evolution of the gravitational field along with the scalar field in a way with an appropriate potential um, started by an homogeneous condition and does this differ uh, from the standard um, inflationary paradigm and this is something that also there was some work about there was some work in the 80s but also something quite recently has been resurrected uh, the generation of tensor modes in the early universe has also been studied with this system. Obviously, in order to study that, you need something that takes into account uh, the tensor mode, the relativistic tensor modes in of um, um, the gravitational field. And so you need the numerical relativity approach. This is also something um, where uh, some work was done recently. And then finally, structure formation in um, um, a, a mo cosmological model. And this is uh, uh, the example that I was having before with nonlinear effects way, um, would be, um, could, could become important. And therefore, you need to factor this, this, uh, uh, these elements in. And again, this is not actually something that started very recently. There are studies by Anino Central, et cetera, as early as the 90s. And of course, this is tremendously limited by computational power. So, um, is it has actually not made so much progress until perhaps recent year and much more progress will have to be done if these are actually going to become interesting models for observations. Um, so basically at this point then, okay, we have a model, we have a recipe to integrate the equations, we have to decide exactly what it is that we want to integrate, we have to exactly figure out what sort of model we're interested in and how to set initial data. And so far, especially in this last burst of studies, there have been two approaches. The first approach is that you try to make a relativistic end body, essentially. So you take your isolated object solution in general relativity, you try to stitch this together in a way that still gives you a global solution to Einstein's equations. And uh, this most in, in, in most cases in, la in the latest year, this has been done with the study of black hole lattices. There are now a, quite a number of papers that study these sort of systems, the ways in which they can be constructed, their optical properties, and I will go into them in greater detail. The second approach is something where you start quite close to a perturbed system, and that helps you because you know that then your system has a very clear perturbative regime. And then by integrating the full equation, you let it leave the perturbative regime, you let it leave the linear regime and see what happens. So your um, integration method in that sense, so the, the, the space that you start with is exactly, um, if you want, um, a perturbed FLRW cosmology, but at once you've chosen this, in this initial data, you integrate them with the full, um, with the full Einstein's equations. And there's benefits and limitation of either approach. So the first one, as I said, it basically entails taking a solution to general relativity, say the Schwarzschild solution, cutting a cube around it, and then stitching other solutions that are identical to the first one, but doing it in a way that still means that at the end you have a full solution to Einstein's equation. If you just take um, a Schwarzschild solution in Schwarzschild coordinate, you cut it at some point, and you, you add another Schwarzschild solution in the same coordinates, you don't get a global solution of Einstein's equation. So you have to be careful. And Lindquist and Wheeler posed this question for the first time in 1957. And since then, there have been various proposals in various approaches in order to solve this problem. 
And the idea is that once you have one such space, say you have something where you have these regularly spaced singularities, so that in some sense it represent masses, at this point though, if you have a global solution, these masses will be aware of each other's presence, so these are no longer isolated objects. Uh, however, they are a full solution of Einstein's equation, they have inhomogeneity, in fact, no linear inhomogeneities in them. And then you can study a number of properties. So the first question, like I said before, is how would this compare to a model that had the say exactly the same average density, but not this sort of inhomogeneities? So you could study, for instance, you could cut out the fundamental cell and study how it expands, and compare the expansion histories of this model to, to the standard perturbed FLRW. And many people have started doing this, there are several roads. The first thing is that you can construct these solutions by uh, applying the so-called general relativity junction conditions. So what you have is that there's, there's a prescription for certain components of the metric or more um, precisely of the second fundamental form that need to be matched at the boundaries. And these conditions tell you everything you need to know about this solution. Another road is to try and um, um, construct these lattices in a sort of expansion in M over R. And again, it, this is quite tricky. You have to be careful exactly how you do it. If you just sum a set of masses with, with uh, M over R contribution to the metric, uh, you, you don't get a convergent solution. So you have to be a bit careful how you do it, but this has been explained quite well in this work. Finally, you could apply the recipe that I said before, so you could try and solve the GR constraints exactly. And there's a number of things here, a number of studies here that uh, explain how you can do this and you get different prescriptions. So in addition to being able to actually look at the system and look at the exact solution that represent this lattice, then you also have a quite interesting general um, uh, you, you derive from this quite interesting general properties about how structures are constructed in general relativity, the, one of the open questions that I had at the beginning. And this general principle, okay, it was actually known to mathematical physicists for quite some time. There were, there were some papers by Shocker Braun, how you, you exactly carry out this construction. And recently it has been given a more physical take, if you want, in this paper. There, these are two phases of the exact same problem. And the, the main idea here is that if you want to construct such a structure, your options are limited. You have to decide exactly how you're constructing um, the geometry of these spaces. And the in very interesting thing is that these um, constraints are exactly the same that you have in FLRW cosmologies. You know, for instance, in FLRW cosmologies, you can say, without a cosmological constant, you know that you can either have a a uh, moment of max recall, a moment of time symmetry, or you can have a non, a, a flat space. If you have a flat, uh, sort of spatially flat model, then this model has to be expanding at all times. If the model is curved, positively curved, then you can have this time in which all time derivatives become zero. And this, this construction is repeated identically in this case. You can either have black lattices that have a conformal curvature, and then you can afford a time where all time derivatives go to zero, or you could have something that's conformally flat, but it will always be expanding. And this implies different types of solution, which implies different, different roads to construct these solutions. So one of these, for instance, is what I said before. You choose to have a conformal curvature, therefore you have a, maxim a moment of maximum expansion and a time where all time derivatives are zero. This is essentially the black lattice equivalent of your closed universes in FLRW, in the FLRW class. And this is quite nice because if all time derivatives goes to zero, the initial data construction is actually very simple. That procedure that I said you have to do at the beginning in order to construct a gravitational field that is consistent with your matter content is very easy to, to, to solve. For, for, one reason, so for one reason above all, this equation is a linear equation. So you only need to find one solution and then you can superimpose many of them and you still get a solution. Problem, of course, with this model is that it is uh, the equivalent, if you want, to a closed model, not so, interested, not, not so interesting observationally. But this thing was integrated uh, in sort of this and then late, later with numerical relativity. In, on the other hand, you could decide 
to have a um, conformally flat model. Uh, but then the, your initial value problem becomes this, because in a sense, this k gives you the sense of the expansion of the space. And like I said, you cannot put it to zero, exactly like you cannot have flat Friedman universe that have zero time derivatives anywhere. And so it's a bit more complicated. You have to solve on a linear elliptic equation, but it can still be done numerically. And in one case, it's, uh, this is a sort of representation of the universe. You basically have a conformal three-sphere with the singularities at the points where you want them. And you can simulate how this thing um, expands or collapses in times. And in 2012, we found that if you do this for at least as long as we can follow the simulation, you actually get a scaling that's extremely close to the FLRW solution. So these are completely different models. They have nothing to do. For one, they, they, ha they are vacuum solutions. Um, they are constructed from the bottom up rather than, than top down, like the FLRW class. And yet, they get exactly the same expansion history for as long as we know, really. And, and, and this is quite surprising. And it was mirrored by this exact same construction in flat cosmologies. Again, they are in the cases at least where we can cleanly fit an FLRW cosmologies to this lattice, you find that they expand very close to each other. Now, this, this is interesting enough, and uh, it's, it's quite comforting in some sense, because you say, OK, then uh, I wasn't so wrong when I was just uh, sort of applying the simplest model that I, that I could. However, when you start taking a look in higher order effects, so you, for instance, could take a look at what the different densities are. Now, so you're taking a certain FLRW model, and you say that it tracks your black hole lattice. But the question is how, for instance, does the, the mass in one of the models compare to the mass in the other? And here is where you start seeing some effects. So the mass of the black hole lattice in some is, in some sense, dressed by the nonlinearities. You need, in order to get exactly the same expansion history, you need much less mass in this in this case than, than in this sort of effective mass that you get by fitting an FLRW cosmology. And we found something similar also. So this is for the uh, um, um, closed model, let's call it, and this is for the flat model. So there's this certainly uh, an effect in which the nonlinearities are not perhaps um, reflected so much in the expansion history per se. You can fit a FLRW model to this lens, but the, the model is not going to be this, the one with the same density. And this is exactly, a, 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 if you want, a consequence of the fitting problem in cosmology. So once you have a nonlinear cosmology or an inhomogeneous cosmology, you know that you can fit this to, or you can fit a homogeneous cosmology to it, but not every single property. You could decide to fit the expansion history, but then the mass will be different, or you could do the opposite. And this becomes um, even more prominent when you start looking at things like light propagation in the space time. So say that you have a cube of this cosmology, you have some, some inhomogeneities in it, and you start tracking geodesics. And for, for the sake of um, um, eliminating things like local effect, you uh, look at geodesics that, that are, in some sense, cosmological in this space time. They are running along the symmetry lines. And um, we've done this last year. And what we found out is that if you probe this, and this probes really higher order effects than the simple expansion, you actually start picking up a lot of differences. So first of all, you see that uh, an FLRW model with the same amount of mass uh, doesn't follow at all, doesn't have the same, uh, at all the same optical properties as this lattice. What f manages to, to feed this um, properties were actually quite well, is what is called the empty beam approximation. This is something that was introduced by Zeldovich in the 60s, where you take a, basically a homogeneous space time, you cut out a part, you empty out a beam, and you study the propagation of light in there. So light, in some sense, is aware of the fact there's mass elsewhere, but uh, there's no intervening matter in the, um, in the propagation, in the beam itself. And, and this actually looked quite excellent. So uh, if we apply that sort of model to our universe, uh, then the difference is not so bad. And these, 
and that, that is quite Im the important part, does not depend on how compact the lattice is. So you can construct lattices of varying mass and uh, spacing, and you could do this in, to Im in order to make a class which whose limit is the FLRW, one, one FLRW model. And um, if you do this, for instance, if you do it for the expansion history, you find that whatever small error there was actually goes to zero, and there is, in fact, a theorem by Mikhail Ekoshinsky that shows that uh, uh, there's a very precise manner in which you can construct the continuum limit, if you want, of black hole lattices, and their expansion properties then are shown to match exactly those of the completely homogeneous system. This is not so for the optical properties. The, op the optical properties will have, so if you introduce this parameter, which is basically the ratio between the mass and the spacing of the, um, uh, the lattice, um, the difference between FLRW and this lattice in this family for varying mu contains, it uh, has a difference of order one. It never goes to zero, even if this goes to zero. And in particular, this difference has the phase of a negative uh, pressure fluid. This is, again, it's, it's not terribly new. People had um, sort of approximation and models in which they, sh they, they could show that this was indeed the case, uh, that um, sources looked in some sense demagnified when looked through a discrete cosmology. Uh, but this is just another example that shows that this effect is quite general. And then this in particular is the Hubble diagram that we obtained. So uh, the dots are basically, so the, the empty circles and the empty triangles are what we obtained for those two, ge two geodesics that I showed at the beginning. And this model was constructed to have the same average density of an einstein decider universe, but an einstein decider universe doesn't match its optical behavior at all. Um, we compare it to a bunch of other things that uh, Truly, the thing that worked the best was the CBA. The CBS was uh, an, extreme, an extremely accurate reproduction in what uh, happened of what happened in the completely exact cosmology. And here's just a difference of what um, all these different um, models did. Unfortunately, this is another problem connected to numerical relativity. You have to be careful how you construct initial data because you could be introducing a spurious amount of tensor modes, and this is exactly what this is at the very beginning, which turned out not to be very important from the standpoint of the evolution, but the moment we started looking at optical properties, they were extremely um, sort of determinant, and they affected in particular the redshift to a great extent. Photons get redshifted and blue shifted by these tensor modes, and then there's, this is reflected in the Hubble diagram, if you want. And this is what I said before, so you're actually uh, looking at very mu lattices, so you take one particular lattice, and then you make it finer and finer, and with a smaller spacing, in order to get to a sort of continuum limit. And this is the EDS behavior, and these are various redshifts. And what happens is exactly this. As, y as you go to mu equal to zero, the solution doesn't go at all towards EDS. In fact, if, if anything, it goes away from it. So you have to be careful in that case. And this is what I would say. You could try to fit a cosmology that contains a cosmological constant. And in that case, you get something that, again, maybe it's uh, positive, but very much affected by those tensor modes. So this is something that will have to be eliminated from the simulations before we could say something cleaner about this. So the question is, of course, OK, so this is, a, in some sense, nice spaces to take a look at nonlinearities of the gravitational field in a way that is constructed bottom up. At the same time, there's a very peculiar spaces, and you could wonder how general we can make this result. And in particular, um, how can we look at the transition between how we can, in, in some sense, look at what happens in a system when we turn on the nonlinearities in a gradual manner. In this space, these spaces start in a very nonlinear way, so they don't help you to address that question. And so we, we thought, and uh, to be honest, we weren't the only ones, um, to take a look at the second approach that I um, um, described. So where you actually start very close to the concordance when you take a perturbed FLRW and only integrate this exactly in order to see if this ever leaves the nonlinear regime, the linear regime. 
And so you construct a perfect fluid cosmology, you give it some perturbations, the metric will get some perturbations as well. So in a sense, this whilst the, there's um, only a small perturbation in the density, we actually solve the Einstein constraint at the beginning. So we have an, an inhomogeneous gravitational field to begin with. And then um, we have much more control over this space. For instance, we could study this as this perturbation goes to zero. And um, here we have really a lot of tools, and that was the extreme advantage. I mean, it's black hole lattice where, where if you want an interesting system to see how extreme the effects could become, but they, they were very hard to compare to anything. When we discovered, for instance, that the expansion history was so close to FLRW, we had very little arguments to uh, sort of build an understanding of this. They explain what, what the simulations were telling us. And for simulation, this is very important because they're really more like experiments than we models. They need a theoretical framework in order to be understood. But here, in this case, well, first of all, we have the, the full machinery of perturbation theory. So, you know, you can express the metric in this way. You have a FLRW background in which Friedman equation holds. In particular, we are using the EDS, the einstein decider model. And then you can write an equation for the perturbation in the, um, the density. And you know that it, it has this form, and this in particular is two solutions. So you know, for instance, how you would expect within the perturbative regime the density contrast to grow. Um, another interesting thing that you could apply to these spaces is what is called averaging framework. So what happens is that um, uh, if you want to study how averages in a relativistic spacetime work, you could do things like defining, for instance, the volume element of a, of a domain D, defining a scale factor for it. So basically this entails a sort of average, obviously doing the integral of the infinitesimal volume element and then studying this. And you know that this leads to an equation which is similar in form to this, but it has an extra term. And that's, however, more or less where um, things start to become complicated because you don't have an equation for this term. So when you average Einstein's equation, in other words, you can only average the scalar part. You don't know how to average parts that are non-scalar, and therefore this system doesn't close. But if you combine this formalism with numerical relativity, you can measure this directly, and therefore um, provide insight as to what the solutions of these equations could be. Um, you could also use perturbation theory. So for instance, so this, this term is basically given by this expression where k is that derivative of the metric that I've introduced. And there are some perturbative results. So for instance, you know that to second order, this should go like this average scale factor to the minus two. And so when we actually went and, take and, and took a look at the results, we found, say, we prepared a cube of this universe with a perturbed fluid at z equal to 100. We evolved it all the way to z equal to 0. And we had different values of the initial density contrast. And we saw, as a matter of fact, that uh, for small enough values of this density contrast, the result stayed very close to the perturbation, the result from perturbation theory, which is essentially the dashed line. And then as soon as you went up, things started departing significantly. That, that is exactly that procedure that I was saying you cannot do in a black hole lattice. You could start quite close there, make sure your simulation satisfy what you think the behavior should do. And once you, you go to higher and higher values of delta, you know that things are st going to start to be different. And this will start to be different. So we, st we started the, the larger density contrast we started with was uh, 10 to the minus 2, which is, I guess, a bit extreme, but shows nicely what happens in the subsequent evolution. And then in this, in fact, you basically observe that the density grows unbounded before z equal to 0 is even reached. And however, there, is, there doesn't seem to be a lot of effect. This is one of the questions that uh, was out there. There doesn't seem to be a lot of effect on the expansion history of that, uh, of that region. So basically, if you take the entire domain and you plot uh, the difference between the relative difference between, say, the scale factor, the average scale factor, and the scale factor of the um, uh, reference solution, then you find that at most, this 
uh, the first by 10 to the minus 3. So whilst there was qu quite a dramatic collapse here, this part of the metric was actually not, not so um, affected. However, if you took a look at local expansion rates, this could be quite different. This could uh, accumulate an error bar that was order 30% uh, um, with respect to the background solution. And collapse, similarly, if you only concentrate in the collapse regions, uh, and you, for instance, you can um, compare these to other models and approximations that are used in order to depict cosmological, say, gravitational collapse in a cosmological setting, uh, then you found that in this case collapse occur much faster, so you have to recorrect uh, those terms. And this, in a sense, uh, shows more, more or less what happens uh, in those cases. Again, this is a difference in the local expansion rate. So KOD is the expansion rate of the over-densities and KUD of the under-densities. And then the, the, the system with the largest delta, uh, we, we did pick up quite, uh, quite some differences. And then finally, we could, you could give a measurement of the famous Q that I showed before that would close the system of uh, coarse graining in general relativity. And the interesting thing is that we, we saw again, again this perturbative regime. So we saw that at some point, uh, for smaller and smaller values of delta, Q actually followed quite closely this A to the minus 2 uh, behavior, but quite, quite rapidly get out of it once uh, delta was large enough. And in this set, set of cosmologies, the other group that has a code that does this sort of integration actually also performed uh, uh, ray tracing, the thing that we did with the black hole lattices. And in this case, they wind up with this uh, Hubble or this, I guess, um, um, difference between um, the, their result of their magnitude uh, diagram in their model and the reference uh, homogeneous space. And they found things so that on average are of order maybe 1%, but could be much higher if you in include um, individual geodesics. So in, in a sense, it's uh, what we were saying before. There's some special um, uh, curves, some, some special places where things depart quite strongly from the background space time. But if you do some sort of statistics, these effects are much reduced. This is exactly what you would expect. Okay, um, so an interesting part of this that perhaps uh, um, people might want to look into is that if you're interested in this sort of studies, uh, you don't actually have to start from scratch. So numerical relativity over the decades has accumulated this code base that is now being collected under what is called the Einstein Toolkit. And this um, contains a number of modules that would do integration. As you can imagine, most of these tools are uh, only relevant for compact object um, simulations, but many of them are actually uh, easy to extend and were extended to other space times. Uh, the source, the, the toolkit is open source. It uh, it is modular, so you can basically take the modules that are interested in, and there's uh, quite many of them, and it's um, it allows you to do things like AMR, different. Um, uh, types and models of parallelization if you want. Uh, it is ported to essentially a lot of HPC systems and again it's basically ready for download. You can go to this website if you're interested. And those those of you with, the, with a cosmological inclination will find okay these parts that are in the toolkit and they're relevant for cosmological studies but also a number of things uh, that we're not and uh, are slightly getting into the toolkit and that I had to add in in order to be able to do um, integrations or construction of cosmological models and you find them basically in these references. So the first thing was an, an initial data solver for cosmology that uh, uh, wasn't in, was, was substantially different from an ID solver for compact objects that he had to be coded from scratch. A uh, model for cosmological dust evolution, analysis, etc. If, if you look in there, you'll find reference to, to all of these different codes. And many of these um, use a very neat uh, construction or a very neat tool in the Einstein Toolkit, which is a code that automatically generates basically your, your modules based on equations that you give in mathematics. And this was a, a tremendous help in constructing, say, complicated models or um, things with, say, um, uh, 
matter content that had a complex uh, system of equations for the evolution. And so at this point, the, the important thing I think from, from this is that if you want to construct, and again, I say this at the large for the large scale universe, but this is not limited to that case. If you want to construct a consistently relativistic model, it is possible to do this and, <coughs> and it's necessary to do so. We've shown that there are in some regimes some things that you would miss out if you didn't do such a construction. And even though, so, so uh, as you can imagine, these are extremely simplified space time where many of the really complex systems cannot be asked. But already what we can uh, uh, face, what we can talk about in these models is quite intriguing. So, first of all, the thing that surprised me the most is this universal initial data no, no go. So, you know that that specific structure, which could have been completely special to the FLRW class of having only cer a certain correspondence between time evolution and curvature is in fact a quite general um, um, theorem in the end. And I, I can go, I, I didn't have time to, to, to go in more detail about this, but, but if anybody's interested I can say a little bit more about why, as a matter of fact, the, the, the F or W structure, if you want, is a general one. And we found that the land scaling, because of basically this follows the FLRW class. You don't pick so much difference um, in when you study homogeneous system in the expansion history itself. You do, however, have a bunch of other properties that are c could be quite, uh, quite prominently affected. And anything that probes higher order effects, such as, for instance, the propagation of light has taught us this. So there's many things that uh, we'll find differences and these things are, as a matter of fact, um, processes that you use in observational missions in order to probe uh, regimes or geometry, etc. So this is something that you have to factor in. And so the, based on these results, it's actually quite interesting to um, try and extend these simulations even more and to try to construct uh, even, uh, say, more sophisticated, more realistic scenarios. In some sense, there are more questions that have opened with the study than, than the ones we've been able uh, to address. And with this, I will stop. Thank you. So this is something that we want to look into. We have some expectation. Basically, the idea is that you will still have to have some sort of regularity, you know, because you want this to have at least uh, some, some amount of large-scale symmetry. And you also want to put it in a box. I mean, it's, uh, unless you did, for instance, the, um, the compact space construction, but that's not very interesting because it's, it's obviously a closed space time that is just going to recollapse. So if you want something that is, um, say in, in uh, it's a non -com has non compact spatial hypersurfaces then you, you have to somehow put it in a box and so the construction that we made gives us confidence that we have control over that now whether you add additional structure inside these boxes and maybe as you say which is less regularly distributed and introduces some randomness uh, this is something that we currently have no simulations on but we know things like the the continuum limit like I say, that the, there's that theoretical um, work by Mikołaj Kozinski that shows that you could have this sort of statistical distribution of black holes. And as long as this is in the mu that goes to zero limit, so these are uh, in the limit where the, their mass goes to zero and the spacing goes to zero, uh, then you have some, some results. So for instance, this expansion history that tracks FLR and W that we know. He has also constructed, so most of the results that we have for this problem are analytical. He's also constructed um, a space where you have a fractal distribution of these black holes. And you can study this as a matter of fact in, um, if, if you're just happy about a specific instant of time, the initial data, you could build things like masses, average densities, and things like this without evolving. And you could do this for any mu, for any type of black hole. And he has 
other results there, yes. Measurement, for instance, how, of how the mass get dressed, that effect that I was showing. Um, but at the level of simulation, it's actually quite, quite hard to do at this point. So, yep. All right, sounds good. <laughs> okay, for, perhaps I should learn not to make presentation with 162 slides. <laughs> no, no, no problem. Yeah, well, uh, okay. Let me just, okay, here we go. Twen Twenty, I would say. Yeah, well, well, okay. Well, All right, sounds good. Uh, yes, I Okay, so. Big effort, big effort for, uh, uh, yes. So, again, uh, let me stress that these are extremely simplified models. And this, the way you see this, for instance, and the thing that, that is a bit puzzling and we haven't gotten to the bottom of this yet, is that, okay, so for one of the space times, we had this, this um, situation. And I think it is tempting to say, oh, look, we have nonlinearities, they increase the mass, they make a larger mass than there actually is in the black holes. And we see this in the expansion. However, when we did this with the other lattice, so not the conformally spherical, but the conformally flat, we found the opposite sign. So we find in that case, if you see the, the um, effective mass is lower rather than higher. And, and so I, I think at this stage with models that are so simple you can't even trust the sign of this. So if you want to get a general thing, it's, uh, it's extreme. So we know in that model behaves like that, and that model behaves like that, and we are sure about this. If you want to draw general conclusions, I think you have to be quite careful. So we know there is a, a, um, an effect. This is an effect, of course, of the way we fitted the FLRW model. That's the other thing. We could have done exactly the opposite thing. We could have fitted, we could have taken the model that had exactly the same um, average density or average mass, fitted that, the expansion history would not have matched. So all of this depends on the model and depends on how you do the fitting. So it's very tricky to get a, this is a universal statement. And, and we, we haven't done it, and I wouldn't do it at this stage. So this, this is actually a question that is extremely relevant. I didn't talk about this at all because in the case of the simulation, it gets a little bit technical. 
but but it is extremely relevant. So what I said is that okay, there's this formalism. We need somehow split things in one plus three, three plus one, uh, and then you have that choice of choosing exactly the the time. So if you want, uh, I had that. Um, functions alpha and beta i, so for one, one, one scalar and, and, and three vector components that tell me how the, the coordinates are going to behave. And I have to decide what to do with it. And in some space times, it could be obvious. Obviously, in, if I had a, an exactly FLRW model, I would want to do nothing else than aligning this with the hypersurfaces of constant, constant density. Why, why would you do anything else? In a space where there are inhomogeneities in general, though, uh, things are not so clear, and the results of uh, measuring things with respect of observers that depend on different frames will be different. So you have to make a decision. I think this is a decision even before, a, a, a problem even before you start making simulations, because More it's an interpretation problem. On how you relate to the measurable problem. E exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly. In addition to this, is that there, there's another problem, which is that we can always make simulations for any arbitrary choice of the coordinates. Some coordinates are bad, basically. And, and we already know this is an effect of general relativity. So if you, for instance, had a black hole and you had geodesic observers, the Gaussian observers, you know they will fall into the singularity in within a certain time frame. And so you, you already know that in time your simulation is limited. So there's a number of tricks, and now we have to blend these two things at the same time. So we want to, in some sense, find a slicing where we see the universe and we measure the universe with respect to some sort of average class of observer prescriptions, and we want to make this in a way that's numerically stable. This problem doesn't have a solution yet. So we've try different things. The dust simulations, for instance, were carried out in the just synchronous gauge. We didn't see a problem until, in fact, the density contrast were go was, going, uh, was growing unbounded. At that point, I, th I think that was the physical singularity, honestly. I don't think there was even a problem with coordinates. If for the black lattices, we have to be careful about the singularity. So we uh, use something that's called the moving puncture gauge. It's a um, coordinate prescription that has been found mostly by people that work in uh, binary black hole uh, collisions um, and that prevents the observers from falling in. So it adds some sort of outgoing shift uh, along with, with different other techniques that are relevant to the, to the slicing uh, so that you can, you can evolve this for arbitrary long times. And, and, but, but these observers then, then are not cosmological at all, and, and, and it's a problem to measure. That, that's why, for instance, we are looking at things like proper distances and stuff like that, because uh, otherwise it's be com completely coordinate dependent. Yeah, you started your, your talk talking about this um, discrepancy of local and large scale determinations for whole concept. <coughs> Can you sort of tie the knot? here and, and tell me how, in your last slide, your conclusions, how, if there's some insight or indications or hints that what these studies are showing about this discrepancy and whether taking into account the right. this, this would have to have the same answer that I gave regarding the, the, the mass, basically. I think in, the, in this toy model, it's really hard to, to, to give any sort of quantitative uh, result. So in some sense, the tensions and the H0, I think, is, is just the, the, the most important that's around right now, but it's by no means the only one. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's more a motivation for us at this stage than anything that we can reconnect to at the end of simulation. This is way too simple so far. Even with the, the fully general statistic simulations on a preferred system? Yeah, but those are, I mean, those are quite simple. Yeah. So you're saying, you're saying even those are too simple to be drawing I think so. Um, yes, I think so. And um, there's a bit of a con controversy here because I think that um, studies that perhaps include like the um, sort of Mertens and Gibling and Starkin studies that uh, address the same sort of uh, relativistic nonlinear cosmology, but with a less, with, let's say, with a sophisticate, more sophisticated uh, density profile. Um, took a look at, say, the dispersion of the expansion rate, and they found s certain properties. And then there was this study where uh, the n-body 
setup was generalized to include local expansion rates, and they found something else, and I don't think there's a particular way to reconcile these two results right now. So the, the thing that I, that I the, the, the simulation that I quoted uh, when I talked about this tension, in some sense said that by, by including in some particular way the effect of inhomogeneities, you could reconcile things. Uh, but I don't think that there's a very clear view of what is going on because there's contradicting results that have come up elsewhere. So again, that's another topic that remains wide open for now. <laughs> no, no problem. No problem. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yep. Oh yeah, that was really towards the end. I think uh, it's uh, <laughs> it's in two slides. Three hundred clicks. Okay, there we go. Ah, okay, yeah, sorry. So what ha what's happening? I'm trying to reproduce something like the, uh, the distribution of the right. okay. radiation or something like that. Mm, no, no, no. Okay, so f first, j just me uh, make a premise. This is actually the study from Ghibli Mare Starkman, so I may not be able to answer every single question. However, the general sense is that they have a cosmology where you have a perturbed fluid, and unlike what we did, they have uh, actually quite sophisticated power spectrum in there. So dis distributing these things statistically, stochastically, with a certain power spectrum. Inside this cube, so this is cosmological dust, Gravity, Einstein equation pair to the um, re relativistic hydrodynamics. And these are... No, 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 no. No, no, this is general relative. Yes. There are two... They do two different models, but we use the same scheme. So we still we still integrate Einstein's equations. And okay. But this is just dust cosmologies in that sense. So basically, the answer to, to our colleague is that dust cosmologies can simulate something more random, so to speak. It's yeah, 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 yeah. Certainly. So to be honest, you you don't need to. So you you start with a perturbation in the density. And, and you want to make it small just so that you're close to things you know, so you can use them as guides. But then you solve the, the Einstein's equation exactly, so the, the, the system doesn't need to be um, perturbative in any sense. Yes, 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 yes. So basically what they did, so then you have the space time, you could study how it evolves, uh, the, how the geometry behaves, etc. And I think that more or less did the same, so from z equal to 100 on. Um, then uh, what they did is they integrated, so they, they cho chose an observer at random and then integrated um, a number of geodesics along the past null, null con. And this is what has happened. So here's the, the observers, and these are light rays that, 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 belong, that basically are on hits null cone. And then you integrate the Sachs equation to get the, say, angular distance or, or whatever. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, what what yeah, yeah, it is. It is, it is. So this is where my, when I asked my question, I, my question was exactly these, these deviations you see on, on local scale uh, could not be indicated that of why we get different <laughs> what they have so to a large scale because right. when you're looking at quantum, you're looking at photons that came from very far away. Right. Whereas when you're looking at global determinants from other you're looking right. at the right. that's that's actually a good point because so the the answer that I said before was when um they calculated so they did not measure the uh H zero via this, but they actually calculated the expansion at every point. Because you, you have the full metric tensor, so you can calculate 
anything you like um, in that space time. And so what they found was uh, that the local expansion rate was n so you had a dispersion obviously but it didn't get to to that point but i am not aware that they have redone this but because of course i mean the, the way you will measure this is right. well, is through this there's two different things is it whether the a whether local expansion is different from a large scale expansion that's one question but the more relevant mm. question to what right. you actually observe is what do you see right <laughs> so that's absolutely so that's a good question i i don't know that they have um looked at the study under that, that uh, standpoint, if they worked out what the dispersion in H0 would be from here. But I, I think you could probably just work it out by eye, because you should just get in in a linear fashion, is it? does it not? So you could say if there's, um, say, I would say here, 4% perhaps? Yeah, and also, I mean, th there is this thing that's, that's also particularly interesting. So this depends on the redshift, the sort of... Uh, dispersion that you get, no? Quite. So, yeah, perhaps. Uh, but I, I I don't think they make a statement on that. Sure, uh, I was just mm. that yeah. You know, in, in hindsight, they probably should have. I'd say it's an interesting question. Essentially, you're using, you're using a presumed uh, standard candles, for instance. So if you're, if yeah. you're getting these kind of differences from right. magnitudes, mm -hmm. you would misinterpret that yeah. being something that's actually closer for the way that Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. But the, the key point is uh, if there's a systematic difference between low redshift and high redshift, then I think they totally have the setup to. Uh, sorry. Yes, so from GR nonlinearity to let me say Right. So the the example that I typically have, because that question is largely a question about algorithms and uh, how how clever you can be with your simulation. And in particular I think the key element, the key ingredient is how you do mesh refinement. If if you want to stick to mesh simulation, say, which which is not even a given. So how Me mesh repair. So you have, say, continuous fields that you integrate as opposed to a uh, particle, uh, which is not even a given. I think people are starting to, to reconsider particle methods in numerical relativity. Back in the 80s, people were doing the sort of no, particle. Let's, let's talk about continuous field. Okay. So in that specific case, things are largely dependent on how well you can do mesh refinement. And the example that, that I usually use for uh, Newtonian simulation, if you want, and body simulations, the illustrious simulation. So, if you were to take um, something that had the sort of resolution that you wanted with the box size that you wanted and do a very basic um, estimate, you will get a number that is completely beyond the, our technological reach. However, in their case, they have this neat infrastructure where you, you can refine in a very um, sort of ad hoc way and uh, gravity in some sense helps you because it, it racks things up in some portions and leaves a lot of void elsewhere. So you only need to resolve some special regions. If you're able to computationally do that, then um, you don't need so much. And in fact, they, they managed to bring down the computational cost necessary uh, with, with this nice infrastructure to the point that they were able to do their simulations, uh, and I'm thinking a, a month, two months, or in Super MOOC, which is a in fact, not 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 even so new a supercomputer, so it's completely feasible. So, when uh, figuring out when when trying to answer the question, I think um, the question is how much you can do computationally, and how much will you be able to, or you be willing to, to program. So, with the Einstein toolkit, we have a specific type of mesh refinement, which is very strongly tuned. Uh, to compact objects, and that that is in in some sense an easier problem. You know where these guys are going to be. You know the trajectories. You don't need to do anything special, and that limits us in cosmology a lot. And I think a transition to something which is qualitatively different will be necessary. Uh, but if that happens, I don't think we're I don't think we're talking about costs that are completely prohibitive. I think. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, 
yes, 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 uh, absolutely. The question is how exactly you blend. So it's, it's never it's never why or whether, but, but how I, are you going to? I, I think there is enough interest on both sides to um, bring a sort of nicely, um, not nice, if you want, computational infrastructure along with, with Einstein's equations. Um, the question is exactly which way you go about this. There's, there's a lot of talk, but this, this is tech, this is really not, not a physics at all. It's a, 